Welcome to everybody to this IDDC webinar on decolonizing methods and methodologies. My name is uh, Sarah de Jong. I'm the co-director of the IDDC, the Interdisciplinary Global Development Center. And we are incredibly excited to have uh, Linda Smith speak today, um, but I will leave it uh, in a moment to my colleague Joe to introduce her. Um, for those of you who have never heard of the IDDC yet, um, it's a mouthful really, but it's an interdisciplinary learning and research community um, for equitable global development, which is based at the University of York in the UK. We are specifically focusing our interdisciplinary research on social justice, global health and sustainable environments. Uh, we also offer undergrad and postgrad academic programs in global development specifically, and we by being an interdisciplinary center, bring together researchers and students from across the humanities, the social and natural science uh, within the University of York, but of course also globally. Of course, uh, decolonizing has become somewhat of a buzzword as of late, and it is certainly part of many university agendas right now, but in many cases um, it has become disconnected really from the long-standing activism and scholarship that people uh, like Linda Tuohawai Smith have actually uh, been pioneering for years and years. And this is also why we are so incredibly ex excited really to have Linda here and to have her share that pioneering work with us, which has gone through many editions already. Now, um, I'd like to introduce our chair for today's seminar. Um, this is my colleague, Joe Turner. He's a lecturer in the Department of Politics at the University of York and his research work focuses on borders and border violence, and in particular the colonial histories and relations of power that underpin contemporary immigration regimes. Now Joe is also a very passionate teacher of methods who I know um, helps and guides his students in asking very critical questions about research and research ethics. Um, so I hand over to Joe with that, um, who will be introducing this webinar and who will be introducing Linda. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Sarah. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to be able to welcome Professor Linda Turwai Smith here today. So we wanted to invite Linda to speak to us today to provide further space to consider her brilliant work and also to reflect upon what decolonizing methods and methodologies might mean in terms of the research that we conduct and the way we teach. So we wanted to recognize that events like this take place as, as Sarah has already alluded to in the context of wider movements and struggles over decolonization. And in the UK context, at least, much of the dominant institutional work on decolonizing higher education has focused on, on teaching materials in particular. And there's an important justification for that. However, at least in the discipline of politics and international relations where I find myself, there's much less interrogation of what this might mean for the research we conduct, the relations of power we're complicit in reproducing when we conduct research, and the practice of methods of data collection in, in field work. There's also a lack of interrogation of the implicit disregard for non-European systems of knowledge and equally indigenous and previously colonized peoples, which is often central to how disciplines function. So this is why we wanted to invite Professor Tuawai Smith to speak about her work. And our hope is for the talk to spark further collective reflection and action on this. Specifically, we wanted to think about what attempts to decolonize research methods and methodologies might mean in elite research institutions in the West, which is where we find ourselves, and in institutions and disciplines which not only privilege certain elite ways of knowing, but also where research is often funded through direct links to imperial exploitation and violence, whether this be historically through links to the, to the slave trade or in contemporary examples through ongoing forms of indigenous dispossession in settler colonial contexts, and direct funding links to things like the military industrial complex. So those are some of the, the kind of rationales for, for inviting Linda and, and thinking on these, on these topics. So as I'm sure many of you will know, Professor Tuai Smith is a highly distinguished scholar and educator, famously the author of the international bestseller, Decolonizing Methodologies, Research in Indigenous Peoples, which has now been translated into multiple languages and the book is now in its third edition. And it remains a foundational resource for critiquing the existing relationship between imperialism, Western science and indigenous knowledge systems. So along with being an international bestseller, 
Linda has worked in and influenced the field of Maori education and health for many years. Linda is one of the first Maori women to become a fellow of the Royal Society. She has received an honorary doctorate in Canada and the Prime Minister's Award, which is the highest national award for lifetime achievement in education. She holds appointments to organizations such as the Marsden Fund, the Waitinga Tribunal, the Maori Economic Development Board, which are all reflections of her expertise and contributions to global and local communities and Maori social justice in particular. In this event, Linda will draw on the third edition of Decolonizing Methodologies, Research Indigenous People, to help think about the principle of decolonizing methods. And I understand that she'll talk about the sensitivities, complexities, and challenges of working with decolonizing methodologies. So now my chance to turn over to you, Linda, and thank you again so much for, for joining us tonight. Uh, tuatahi he mihi kia koutou uh, katoa, um, ko hukurangi te maunga, ko waiapu te awa, ko ngāti prau te iwi i te taha o taku māma, taku kōka, uh, te taha o taku matua, ko putaua ki te maunga, rangita ki te awa, ngāti awa te iwi, nō reira, tēnā koutou katoa. Greetings everyone. I just sent greetings to you from my two big mountains, one called Hikurangi on the east coast of the North Island of New Zealand, uh, which is where my mother's people are from, and our iwi or tribe is called Ngāti Puro, and the other, which is very close to me right now, Putoaki, uh, in the eastern Bay of Plenty, which is where my father's iwi, Ngāti Awa, reside, and where I am right today uh, in uh, my new institution, Te Whare Wānanga o Awanui Arangi, which is a tribal university, teaches up to PhDs, and um, it was founded by my father, who's uh, still alive, he's 94, and was a former professor uh, of Māori studies at Victoria University. So, greetings to everyone. It's been lovely seeing just the text coming through. I see there are people from Canada and Rwanda and Europe and Norway and um, looks like northern, northern Norway where I've been up to Kotokeno and I've been, uh, you know, Treaty 6 territory. So just one to, or Treaty 7 uh, territory. So I just want to acknowledge all of you. I can't see you all. Um, but I, I can imagine you all, and thank you for spending an evening, your evening, uh, with me. It's morning here in New Zealand, and um, the sun is shining, so that's always a good day, and hopefully, you know, we're going into summer, so our spring, spring flowers are out. It's a beautiful day. So it's a beautiful day to talk about methods and methodologies. It's a beautiful day to talk about um, research. And I guess my work really uh, in thinking about the colonial project, thinking about imperialism and colonialism uh, and colonization, specifically as a knowledge and epistemic um, project and what that has meant for thinking about knowledge, uh, for thinking about the institutions of knowledge that colonialism uh, brought from Europe and the UK in particular for us in New Zealand, uh, and how those institutions have sort of basically redefined our world here. Um, the world of many Indigenous peoples sort of stamped a kind of authority over what counts as knowledge, where knowledge comes from. And while doing that has really been, you know, powerful in erasing, negating and ridiculing um, what Indigenous peoples knew and the worldview of Indigenous peoples. And by knowledge institutions, I mean a wide range of institutions. Um, obviously, you know, universities, uh, the centerpiece of those knowledge institutions, but they're also 
uh, learned societies, and the Royal Society is one of those. So it was kind of ironic I got made a fellow of the Royal Society on two levels, you know, fellows were males, um, and they haven't changed that term. But also this assertion of um, these civil society organisations that were established uh, alongside um, governments to support science, to support knowledge, to support the sort of hegemony uh, that was kind of laid down in the same way as uh, you know, across territories in the same way as governments establish themselves. The church, the churches are knowledge institutions because they too were avid, um, well, A, exploiters, but B, avid collectors of knowledge. I mean, priests, you know, even in Latin America were writing dictionaries, encyclopedias. They were, the Jesuit order were recording the death of indigenous peoples, the death of their language. And right up, you know, until I was in university, which is a long time ago before some of you were probably born or, or even a little seed of an idea, um, there was always the sense that many disciplines were established to study indigenous peoples before they died off, to study our language before it disappeared to study our, our culture before it got corrupted. Um, and, you know, that sort of mission of knowledge, I think, really um, frames and determines um, then what research is about and how we understand research, the ethics of research, the um, the approach that one takes to research, especially if that research involves, is targeted at um, communities of color, marginalized communities, indigenous communities. So historically, of course, you know, the word civilized, the English word civilized and civilizing concepts of civilizing as a policy especially in the UK, were applied initially to um, the Irish and then also to women and to children. You know, and if you <clears throat> go back into that sort of history, a lot of the approaches to policy in terms of taming, um, you know, bringing people, bringing women, bringing children or, you know, into this idea of being civilized, that many of the, these concepts were practiced, particularly in Ireland, uh, but also in the UK itself, before it, they were then sort of exported to Canada and South Africa, Australia and New Zealand. Um, so they didn't just land here in New Zealand um, innocently as a way to treat Māori, there was a history to that. It was clearly informed by deeper and more historical um, doctrines, such as the doctrine of discovery. And in Australia, the doctrine of terra nullius, the right to claim empty land. Um, and all of those then kind of speak to concepts of human, who is a human, who is a, what is a human being, what are humans entitled to, what are they not entitled to? What are they capable of? You might think that's all very philosophical and has nothing to do with the kinds of research you want to do today. I think my work shows that those deep, profound ideas have always impacted um, even what we try to do today. When we think about ethics policies, for example, so much of that is about these kind of the human subject. Um, and what is it right and moral to do? But what if peoples are not seen as human? You know, and col colonialism was very much a process of dehumanizing, of categorizing, classifying living entities as whether they were human or not human. 
it was the you know the beginning of these sort of chains of being and hierarchies of um who were seen as to be say you know salvable they, they they were capable of salvation because they had a soul who was civilizable because they seemed intelligent um, and therefore they could be educated while their land was being taken away from them so I think a lot of what I'm speaking to is our story here in Aotearoa. Um, it's a very different story in other countries and places like Canada, where I see some of you are from, uh, and also our neighbours in Australia um, and in South Africa. So it's um, this knowledge project is powerful. And I think when uh, when I think about research, when I was thinking about it as a master's student many years back, that, that was, you know, that was the bit that really um, sent, sent, sent me off on this direction because I couldn't really get past the way uh, research was dis described in terms of our positionality as researchers in the social sciences, you know, the, the languaging of, um, of sort of researching about indigenous communities or communities, you know, um, whether they were peoples of color or they're marginalized communities, the sort of sense that the researcher um, not only was very powerful, because they were the important um, sort of intelligence in the research. But they had this kind of moral authority as well. Um, they had the right to be distant, that um, you know, researchers were trained to be distant, objective, um, and they had this sort of authority to, to, to determine what were the proper questions to ask? You know, what, what was the knowledge that needed to be discovered? And that really stuck in my craw, um, in my throat, because I never saw it like that. I, it seemed supremely arrogant. And um, I didn't want to be that kind of researcher. In fact, I thought it was impossible for me as an Indigenous woman to be that kind of researcher. It would be lying. It would be like setting up all these fictions, you know, the fiction that I did not belong to that community, um, that I had no relationships in that community, the fiction that um, my gender didn't make a difference in my community, uh, that it didn't give me access in differential ways uh, to people in my community. And I didn't really want to be a researcher who had to create those sort of fictions um, around that identity. I wanted to be a researcher who, res who came from a community and was doing research with and for that community. Um, who could speak to um, our communities in the ways that um, we understood, who could help set agendas um, where research was more powerful. So I just want to put that aside a bit, you know, because that's really the sort of speaking back to the Western sort of knowledge system. But I want to flip it now and talk, you know, specifically about. Māori and where I'm from, because we have our own worldview, we have our own theories of knowledge, we have our own amazing stories of creation and of how we got to be in Aotearoa. Our ancestors navigated the Pacific as the largest waterway in the world, and we have relations in Hawaii and Samoa and Tonga, mm. so our language um, you know, traveled across the Pacific Ocean as well. And our ancestors set themselves here in Aotearoa. 
they have very explicit, you know, in our, in our stories, we have very explicit stories about knowledge and about research. And what I saw when I was at university was this kind of institution like the university um, teaching these disciplines about knowledge, most of which, in fact, all of which negated any other possibility. And then I went home to my communities and I heard, you know, uncles and aunties and grandparents talk about all the time our stories. It's how, I, how we identify ourselves. Um, the waka, the canoes that we cross the oceans on, cross the ocean, we still identify that as important. We talk about our mountains and our rivers, that they're that they are living entities, that who we are is, and what we are has come about because of our mountains and rivers, because of the canoe traditions, waka traditions that we had, because of our ancestors. Um, the search for knowledge is very much part of our cosmology, this human search for knowledge. And so, you know, from that, thinking about that, I sort of understood that actually we do have our own concepts of knowledge. We have our own concepts of research um, and we have our agendas for research. And that's really what is in the first um, edition, I think of decolonizing methodologies was, I think my task in that first edition was it wasn't just to critique Western research. You know, the first half of the book does that. But it was also to show Indigenous peoples and to show my people in particular that peel away all that Western stuff. And what you find when you look at our world is a world that valued knowledge, um, that had agency, that had a philosophy of being, living, what that meant, um, and another way of thinking about the world that was still relevant today, that we could set an agenda about doing our own kinds of research um, that was important, that helped us solve the issues that we wanted solved, help us reframe those so that they made better sense to us, um, but also help us think about navigating uh, the future. So the, you know, the decolonizing methodologies work that I've done has always been in, in a way in those two parts. Um, the part is about understanding scientific imperialism, colonialism, colonization, the impacts of that, understanding, you know, disciplines of knowledge, knowledge institutions, um, right down to departments, universities, the power systems in there. But that on its own is not just what I've ever wanted to do, because I've also had to help lift up and shine a real positive light on Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous methods and Indigenous processes and use those to really shine a mirror or, or sort of cast a different spotlight then when we're thinking about research. You know, simple things like your question that you might have in research. Um, how do you interrogate that question? Whose position, you know, what position are you coming at? Um, to what extent when you look at other people across the, the world that you want to go and work for, you know, what motivates that? Uh, to what extent is that motivated by this, you know, wanting to help, wanting to save, wanting to civilise, um, wanting to do something good? Where does that motivation come from? And that, to what extent is that just an extent of sort of colonialism, if you like, and, and moral superiority. You know, those are challenging, I know, but they are really important questions to ask. They're, they're what you ask before you even get to that ethics part of research. 
Um, and whose question is it? Is it a question defined by the literature, you know, by a literature written about those people by white people? Or is it being defined in negotiation, um, in dialogue, in consultation with those communities? Is it their question? Or is it a government's question? Or is it some sort of academic uh, question that really is of little consequence and will make no impact um, for, those, for those communities? I mean, I think those questions are ones that you need to ask before you even leave, um, you know, universe, leave the sort of safety of your uh, study to go out and do research. Even if you're sitting in the library doing research, you know, you're still trying to make sense of something out there. And I think it's important to interrogate what's in you and, and to what extent um, education has given you certain sorts of lenses and frames to do research, but has not given you other lenses and other frames um, which might be more useful in the sense of what of what your intentions they might better map onto your intentions there are there are also some obvious um, questions i think about ethics a lot of i mean i think much has been written uh, around research ethics and the story of ethics i'd like to think you know that um, all researchers now who, who come out of institutions are governed by ethical policies and by um, understanding really important principles, uh, the principle of informed consent, of in confidentiality, um, the right to withdraw, for example, the right not to participate whatsoever, um, the right to say no, all those things you might think Oh yes, done that all. But I see here, um, you know, every now and again, researchers who come to New Zealand from other countries who get really upset if our people don't talk to them. You know, they, they've got all the skills of hunting you down. They can find you uh, by text, by message. They can turn up at your front door, but people still do not have to talk to you. Um, and I think that sense of entitlement that researchers are often trained to have is, is really important to break that down, to, to be humble, not to be falsely humble, but to be genuinely humble. Um, because I think as a as a character, as, as a part of your character uh, in researching with Indigenous uh, communities, humility is important. Not, I mean, it's important because we basically know nothing as researchers. Doesn't matter how fancy our degrees are, what elite institutions you went to, it doesn't mean a stuff. Um, to be honest, you start as an infant, uh, when you're out in the communities and, and in my community in, in particular, even I find it hard to research in my communities. They're like ornery and grumpy and um, they're smarter than you. And, you know, it takes months, years, decades to build relationships, to sustain relationships and then to negotiate particular um, research that you want to do. And what you're good at doing is not necessarily the, res the research that they want to do. So I've spoken really broadly about a whole lot of issues. And of course, I haven't got to specific methods um, that you might want to use. In the third edition of Decolonizing Methodologies, which is the yellow book, came out earlier this year, 
um, I've added a whole another chapter on, I think I've called it 20, um, 20 more projects or 20 further projects or whatever that go with uh, 25 projects. So that's like 45 projects. I did try and get to 50, but I would have just been making up five. Um, I think there's a range of different ways to understand, you know, what it is that you could be looking at, um, ways that you can think about um, specific methods. I mean, to me, your method is a particular tool you might use, like an interview. Your methodology is uh, more about why would you interview? You know, what is the rationale for interviewing someone in the first place? What is it you're expecting to gain that you don't already know that you couldn't look up in a book? Um, you know, in our world, wasting people's time is quite a big issue. Why, why would an old person who gets no money other than the benefit spend two hours with a researcher when that researcher waste their time. So it's, um, there are ways of doing your methods that really need you to think a great deal about your theory of knowledge that sits behind your method, all right? Because it's not just a method, uh, the method is, is a reflection of what you think about people, about ethics and about knowledge um, and about basic fundamental things, for example, time. Um, why one hour for an interview, not three days or not five interviews of 10 minutes? You know, we become very routine about those sorts of methods. And I think in the Indigenous world, um, or, or any community really, it's to what extent do our methods map well into natural, the rhythms of life, if I put it like that, and to what extent do they jar and then start to represent power in a particular way. So, for example, questionnaires are often associated not with research, uh, but with governments wanting to do something. And so people already have their back up. Back up. Yeah, so haven't spoken about the third edition much at all as I had planned to do. But there are some extra projects uh, in there that you might want to think about. And I really, you know, I use the word project because it's plain and simple. I'm not one who creates lots of fancy words uh, for something where I think there is a plain and simple idea uh, behind it. But I also use it because the kind of research that we do in Indigenous communities isn't just about academic, defined by universities type research. Um, it's also about what our communities choose to do how they define their methods and what they can do completely independent of any um, university or any discipline or any government agenda. It's what they are trying to do to revitalize their culture, um, to find you know, what's really important. So just for those of you who are now listening from Canada, I'm going to use an example and I just want to you know, acknowledge really the trauma of the recent findings of more and more remains from residential schools in Canada, um, and I think also in the US. And I know going backwards and forwards, the extent to which um, all my colleagues and students I've taught in Canada, um, the, the, the story of residential schools is a powerful story I've heard for ever since I've been going to Canada, which is from um, the 1960s uh, was when I first went. And, 
you know, recently in the news, there's been talk of finding these remains. Now, most of the people that I know who are Indigenous, they're not surprised. They've been waiting. They've been waiting for that. But when they talked about it 20 years ago, no one believed them, all right? Scientists didn't believe them. Educationists didn't believe them. Governments didn't believe them. It was like they were making up their, their history. Well, they've have come back um, these you know children who went to who were sent to those schools they've returned in a way and that is often the story of indigenous knowledge is it returns comes back and it comes back often in a way that is haunting poignant um, traumatic or re-traumatizing, uh, but also it is reassuring because what it, it tells us is what our grandparents were saying was true. What our great-grandparents were saying that was true. And so much of, you know, our story as Indigenous peoples is having our truth denied. And it comes back. It always comes back. It appears, might be lying underground, hiding. As we say, it's often hiding from us and then it reveals itself. And I think that's why people like me get driven by research because we're nosy and inquisitive. We want to know. Um, and also we've got the stubbornness and persistence because we think we need to find it. And then we've got this political agenda which says we have to find it um, because that's our truths. That's a, those are our stories and they need to be told. So I'm going to stop there. I said I'd only talk for 30 minutes and I've gone on a bit. Um, so I'm looking forward to your questions and I'll see if I can answer them. I don't guarantee that I will. And I definitely may not be able to get to all of them. Thank you so much, Linda. That was that was really really powerful. Um, I'm going to turn to the um, the questions in, in a second. But as we've got so many people from so many different parts of the world, um, from so many different backgrounds, I thought it might be quite nice to do a quick poll, if that's okay, um, just to find where where our audience is tonight. So really interesting distribution, mainly people from uh, North America. Um, Europe as well, but also people in Central and South America, Southeast Asia, Middle East, Central and East Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa. So we have, we have participants from, um, from Oceania as well, Caribbean, pretty much people from all, all parts of the world, which is, which is really fantastic. Um, so now I'm going to turn over to, um, to the questions. So first off, um, so we have one from anonymous attendee. What do you have to say about the contention between indigenous knowledges and attempting to legitimise them in Western institutions? Well, that's all. It, well, that's thank you. That's a good question. I mean, I think the first level of the legitimisation of indigenous knowledge really has to be in our own communities, in indigenous communities, because firstly we've got to um, legitimate and have processes for doing that. You know, in oral traditions and oral cultures, we do have multiple ways in which um, stories are sustained over generations and, you know, what sort of fits within and is seen as legitimate and what is sort of seen as a little bit different and people might have discussions about that. So number one, it's more important that we understand the legitimacy of our own stories and our own knowledge. And then I think in terms of universities, I always struggle with this in the sense of to what extent, and I have written about this, do you know, Western methodologies um, really influence the, the, the shape 
of Indigenous knowledge. And uh, I think I've, the paper I've written is about methodology and mayhem um, in terms of disciplining, Western disciplining of Indigenous knowledge, which I think becomes quite problematic. But is there Indigenous knowledge in the academy? I think in New Zealand you would find there's some very powerful um, examples of good research, uh, research being done with tribes and individuals that there's a great deal of, um, you know, uh, collaborative work happening in the Māori knowledge space. But there's always this caution, you know, universities can't help but take over and, um, you know, I guess some of us have to have this role of making sure that they don't take over and then simply recolonize. Thanks, Linda. So I think that the next question plays off, off that really nicely. Um, so this one is, what do you think about European scholars using indigenous methodologies to decolonize their research? Is this really decolonization of Eurocentric knowledge production or instead violent reappropriation? Yeah, that's another superb question. I mean, my first question is, why would they do that? I, I never understand the motivation um, for doing that, because it is appropriation. Um, and it's kind of worse if it doesn't come with a, a politics around, you know, what, what that politics is of being engaged in Indigenous uh, methodologies. But the other side of that is I've seen lots of examples and. I mean, we talk about it all the time in the Indigenous world is it's like Western science is catching up, um, you know, with Indigenous knowledge. So, for example, you know, many Indigenous philosophies see nature um, and humans as being all connected, related. Uh, for us, we're related in our genealogies. And so we've always had this concept of, you know, a forest, for example, is a living entity, it feeds itself, it communicates with itself, and it is traumatized if humans do things to it that are, you know, overly dramatic, like burn it down. And we have, we have ceremonial practices for taking a tree down. So when you see scientific research which says, you know, trees communicate with each other, uh, we go, oh, yeah, well, we've always known that. Um, and there's that extent to which good ideas will, will come out, and then that's different from the actual appropriation of Indigenous culture, Indigenous language, and Indigenous methods that are, that are really just grabbing and putting into a Western framework. And that's really destructive. Mm. So it is violent in that sense. And divorcing it. And the worst thing that happens is then telling Indigenous students they can't do that. You know, they can't use Indigenous methods, but the teacher can. That's really fascinating, Linda. And I guess it goes to some of the things you were talking about in the in the talk as well about the consequences of, of research and whether it actually does provide support and betterment for particular communities that are, that are subject mm. to that as well. Um, so we've got, we've got two questions that I think are quite similar to each other. So I'm gonna put them together if that's okay. So um, this one is about imagining futures for um, indigenous research and indigenous communities. So if you were to imagine the futures of indigenous research, how do you see collectivity being further pushed? Um, and what kind of futures might you imagine? Or, or want to come out of that? Of research? Um, just research? Research and indigenous knowledge production. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's right now in Aotearoa, I, don't, I can't speak for other places, but it is vibrant and um, there's, there's a lot of government support for Māori knowledge. We're at an interesting intersection where um, for years we've been arguing for it and now the government is starting to fund 
uh, like all government funded research has to um, in the proposal address the implications of that research for Māori knowledge and for the Treaty of Waitangi. So that's a very um, interesting place to get to. And, and that has led to really the um, blossoming of, of Māori researchers across disciplines across um, the country. But interestingly, you know, I work at a tribal institution, you can see the name just above me, and our researchers who are all community-based and Māori knowledge specialists don't really participate in those government um, sort of uh, proposals because they feel excluded, uh, because the discourse is still very elitist, sciencey, university um, type sort of framing of what the research should look like. And um, you know, that's not really the kind of work that my colleagues here do. So part of my new role is to try and um, bridge that gap in a sense. So there is a future, that's the first off. And it's not really about government or non-Māori. To me, the future is how does Māori research improve the conditions, freedoms, sovereignty of Māori, first and foremost. How does that raise up our communities? How does that lift our aspirations? How does that change the, you know, inequities that we face? So first and foremost, it seems to me, Māori knowledge and Māori research has to benefit Māori communities then it can benefit society and the world at large. And in fact, a lot of what we do is of wider benefit. But if it doesn't benefit us, well, then it's just as exploit you know, exploitative as any other kind of research, and it's dumb. Um, you know, I just, that would be my plain language way of saying it's pointless if it doesn't raise our people up. Fantastic. Thank you, Linda. So there's, there's, there's two of the questions that I think we can condense together, and it's about advice for Western researchers um, or non-Indigenous researchers. Um, how or what advice would you give to make space for Indigenous co-researchers in research projects in a good way without reburdening them with, with, with work? Mm. There's no easy answer to that. I've had a lot of experience um, in my early career of working with non-Indigenous researchers. Some of that experience was fabulous and it's why I'm here today because I was given the freedom, encouragement, support, resources um, to follow my head and my heart, uh, which is what the, my principal investigator who was a respiratory physician said to me, I trust you, you go away and do this and let's see where you get to and I'll help you. But I've also been in projects where I've just felt used um, that a lot of what I was trying to um, let them know was not listened to as a consequence of which you know, the research project got into trouble and I was left having to defend a project that was indefensible, um, which I couldn't do. And I think the, a range of those things happen. Um, to, to me for, um, see, there, there's a big driver and I'm sure it's in the UK as well as uh, here in New Zealand, Australia, and probably in Canada, funding drives behaviours in, in really bizarre ways. And if people think, you know, they'll get funding to do this work with an Indigenous community, well, they're really quick at grabbing onto it, but they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what it means to be in there. And then management, they don't stop and think conceptually, ethically, um, socially about what it is they're trying to do. You know, to me, their first obligation is to grow the capacity, 
um, of a researcher, an Indigenous researcher, but accept that often the Indigenous one is the one with expertise in the Indigenous space, not them. How do you as a student navigate that? It's really hard because, I mean, one of my jobs now as an older auntie um, is often having to mentor and advise um, younger Māori scholars who got into projects and then found themselves overwhelmed or just feeling awful uh, because they found it racist and exploitative and, you know, um, my general advice is get out as fast as you can because um, there's no good ending if, if you start like that. Thanks, Linda. And I think there are some interesting parallels with the way community researchers are, are often treated and, and used in, in the UK context as, as well mm -hmm. in a kind of, you know, post-imperial context. Um, so there's a question here about the context of research in COVID, which is interesting. So um, this participant is struggling to imagine how they engage in research without it being face to face, in person, engaging in a ceremony if necessary. Do you have any thoughts about how to do research with Indigenous people and communities from a distance? Is it is it appropriate in the current context? That's hard. I, I mean, I'm just... I'm, you know, I've got projects at the moment which are in the area of family violence and it is really challenging to um, just do things online and by Zoom and um, or, you know, phone or emails and things like that. There is a point at which being in context is really important and, and in my own projects we've had to suspend that part of it and move into working more with like community-based provider groups and you know people who are employed if you like in this social support space and then when the opportunity of our lockdown and can move around a bit to try and set up groups I, I mean I think the key principle is relationships first and then the sort of what you might call the ceremonial parts, which are part of the relationship building and then the transitions into um, the research. Those things, um, if you're well connected into the community, you can sustain um, online. If you're starting out, it's really challenging. I don't have a simple answer to that. I struggle with that myself. And so what we've done is just set it aside and, you know, turned our, our methods upside down and started with um, people who we know because they've, they've got access for a start off to uh, the internet who we can interview and run focus groups. But we're also thinking, how do you put ceremony into Zoom? Um, and I'm on one project at the moment. We've got little mystery boxes that are going to turn up at people's homes soon. Um, and in the mystery box are things that are, you know, we're, we're going to use as um, during the course of our, our gathering to enact ceremony um, at home while people are at home, but also trying to cater for senses, the sense of smell, the sense of taste, sense of touch, um, and, and just trying to build something different into into these Zoom sessions, webinar sessions. Listen to that. I mean, that's what wonderfully inventive um, and really fascinating to hear about. So I, th I think this this follows on from from a couple of questions that we've had. Um, but how, how would you advise introducing the idea of decolonizing methodologies when teaching students in, in particular? Well, I have taught um, a courses on decolonizing methodologies. I started at 500 level, which is master's level. And then recently, in, when I was at the University of Waikato, I taught a 200 level paper, which is second year undergraduate. Um, and mostly Māori students were in my uh, class. 
and I hit them with the enlightenment. Uh, right from the get-go, and you just think, I don't know how they're going to cope, but they do, and they love it, and they're like, oh, my God. You know, because in New Zealand, obviously, they, they, they don't teach um, that part of history anymore. Um, I majored in history as a student, undergraduate student, so the Enlightenment and um, Renaissance, all those sort of periods were, were things that were the core of a history major, not New Zealand history, not, you know, colonial history, but straight up European and British history was, was what I majored in. And so I do teach decolonizing methodologies. Um, I do start with, uh, you know, ideas about knowledge, Western knowledge, epistemology. Um, I link that to scientific imperialism, scientific racism, you know, the, the way eugenics evolved, the extent to which our theories of intelligence have been informed by eugenics. Uh, by very specific ideas about race, uh, the formation of racial hierarchies. So I do kind of take them through that all the way then to thinking about, um, you know, questions. And, and there's some really practical examples that, you know, you can use even at undergraduate level. So I don't think it's something you wait until they're fully colonized before you do the decolonizing. I think you start as quickly as possible um, to get to get students really living and, and breathing, you know, a, this different way of um, thinking about knowledge. And, and for them then it be it becomes something that's not different. It becomes something that's very normal for them. Thanks, Linda. Yeah, and no, I think the idea of introducing um, decolonized methods very early on is, is a really important one. And to think about the way in which we hierarchize knowledge in terms of things being the end of a course or the beginning of a course, uh, the, these, thing, these things do matter, I think, don't they? Um, rolling off the back of, of that discussion, um, the, there's a, a question about what would you understand decolonizing higher education to mean in the context of a colonizing nation? Um, and, and I understand this question is to be um, asking this from the context of higher education in Germany, where decolonization is often used quite tokenistically. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've spoken to um, some and a uh, couple of symposiums in Germany. I mean, I think European um, institutions and ones in the UK kind of have to fess up to their own imperialism and get a grip on what happened in their colonies in Africa, in the Caribbean, in Latin America. And, you know, to, to me, you can't skip that history and you can't skip um, or gloss over the, the human tragedy um, of European imperialism and colonialism in the South and the impact of that. You can't gloss over slavery and the extent that slavery built economies that enabled European nations to, <clears throat> you know, create their wealth, which they think you know, they got from their hard work. I mean, all there's so many myths of um, nations that are just founded on um, exploitation of others, exploitation of their countries, or actually theft of their countries, theft of their resources, theft of their bodies, exploitation of their bodies, those sorts of things. So decolonization can't be done in a vacuum where you ignore what's happened in the past. And I think that's the big confrontation. That's, you know, some people say that's hard. I, you just have to do it. Um, try being colonized because we, have to, we confront our past every moment. You know, we walk out our doors. 
we know what it means to be the minority in our own lands, to have our the names of our beautiful landscape be completely changed and named after, I don't know, some English lord or noble who never came to New Zealand ever. So those are just really important hard work things that have to be done to even begin to kind of think about knowledge and what that's meant for the academy, the way disciplines are organised, the way language, um, you know, the language gene of knowledge is so much based on this idea of discovery. You know, I mean, the word discovery honestly puts, you know, make some of us feel, ooh, um, where are they going with this language? Because the Western language of knowledge is built on Western exploitation of the other. Thank you, Linda. That was, that was really, really powerful. Um, there's it's a, a couple of questions that we probably have, uh, have time for. Um, there's one here that I think would be really interesting to engage with. Um, so in telling Indigenous stories, what do you think might be the role of the listener? And, and they clarify this by saying, I mean, how can the audience listener be hospitable to the stories that are being told? Are you assuming the audience is not Indigenous? Because Indigenous audiences are fabulous, <laughs> interactive and literate, all right? So there's, there's a difference when you're telling a story to a literate audience because they know all the ins and outs and they know, um, you know, where, you, where the storyteller is um, hitting the, the motif in the right way or, or that kind of genre. If you're telling a story to a non-Indigenous audience, that's always challenging because at one point, there's a fascination with, the diff with something different. You know, so I don't know if you've ever watched um, movies, you know, a film by Indigenous filmmakers and that often our stories are unique. Some of them are like profoundly depressing and traumatizing, uh, but some of them also quirky, funny, and audiences relate to them because they're different. And, you know, in that difference, they can, I guess, put a lot of their own sort of worldviews into kind of making sense of that. In the academic uh, world, you know, when I've tried to, um, you know, talk about Indigenous, you know, our, our stories, if you like, our, um, like, like maybe a, a philosophical idea, for example, that uh, mountains are entities. You know, it's taken me years to get confidence to be able to assert that, those things. I, I have very um, sort of profound experiences of being a PhD student, having to do seminars in front of um, non-Indigenous scholars, you know, having to prove I understood where the word hegemony came from. I could sort of go through all the various iterations of Marxism. So that idea of performance, um, you know, and performance anxiety in that sense was really traumatizing. I was traumatizing for the women anyway, uh, but for I was the only Indigenous scholar. It was particularly uh, challenging. And then I kind of found my voice. And I found my voice by understanding I didn't really care about what they thought about me. <laughs> you know, that what I cared about was that I, that I could um, articulate these, these ideas, I could sort of frame these ideas, um, and I could sort of speak about them really matter-of-factly and clearly, and, um, and then start to kind of connect them and disconnect them from you know, all the other sort of philosophies and, and theories that um, I was learning at the time. I, I was fortunate as a graduate student to have fabulous white men as my supervisors, who, you know, one was a psychologist and one was a sociologist, 
uh, and they were the, the best at the pick of the bunch at the time. Um, and they were really uh, amazing in terms of, you know, what I've subsequently heard about, you know, other doctoral supervisors. I had two fantastic um, men who helped me, supported me, listened to me, sometimes went cross-eyed when I was talking and, you know, one of them would look at me and then he'd say, you need to read so-and-so. You need to go and read this and go to page 63, chapter 4, 63, you know, and, and I'd go, okay, off I'd go and I'd read that and then, of course, it would take me on a little journey for a month or so and then I'd come back and I'd read that and he'd listen again and he'd say, you know, all right, you know, think about this. And his feedback on my PhD, I think students now would probably feel like it's completely inadequate, but it consisted of apostrophes, uh, exclamation marks and stars. And then there were like three apostrophe marks and maybe star, star, star. And then I knew I was in trouble if the exclamation mark went from the top of the page to the bottom of the page, you know, and that meant, and I'd read thinking, what does this mean? And I'd really think about it. Um, and I was gonna have a discussion uh, with him about it. And then he'd give me reading and off I'd go. And, you know, if you, if you look at, the first edition of decolonizing methodologies, especially the first half, you'd see a wide range of literature um, that I read. And, and that was because I had supervisors who encouraged me to go there. Thanks, Linda. I think we could all learn a lot from uh, those supervisory techniques. That sounds brilliant. Um, so I'm going to try and squeeze two more questions in, if that's uh, if that's possible. Uh, play around with the a little bit of the time here. Um, so we've got one on um, COVID. Um, are there any specific campaigns about COVID making use of native Maori knowledge um, that you know of? Um, and this is um, a question for a, from an academic at the University of York, uh, Paul Kilswell who's asking because they're running a project on this in Ghana and similar issues are arising there. So they're wondering if there's mm. anything you know of. We have um, several organisations, Māori organisations that, um, you know, have been really active during COVID. But let me just go back a little bit. Um, so when I think about Māori knowledge, I don't think just about knowledge that our ancestors had. To me, Māori knowledge continues. So we have Māori knowledge, you know, about past epidemics, about how we live now, but how our families are organised now. So to me, that's all in the realm of Māori knowledge. It's important because um, other agencies and, and community providers or, you know, national providers have no knowledge little knowledge of how our families are structured now. So for example, when we went into lockdown, just before, because we got given a couple of days notice, a lot of our families reorganized and they did it, they moved houses, but they did it to um, ensure that our old people weren't alone or that ones who had to work didn't have full responsibility for children. So children are moved around or families moved in with other, others to make sure there was a kind of family structure there. Others went home, you know, they got wherever they were in the urban area, they drove back to their tribal territory. So to me, that's all part of knowledge, uh, part of the way we live and the way we navigate in the world. So there are lots of examples here then of how our Māori, what we call community providers, social service providers, have used that knowledge to educate, inform, contest, um, right from the get-go, our Māori medical doctors. Um, you know, they, they've set up, they set up a website and they've basically framed all the information so that Māori communities, Māori people understand it. 
and they've constantly contested the government around issues of equity. Um, you know, there's been big campaigns about why didn't they um, vaccinate Māori first and Pacific Islanders because they're the most vulnerable communities. They still are, I think, in the latest rounds of those who are getting Delta, about, you know, 50-50% Māori and Pacific Islanders. Um, so it's really critical. And what we do know is government and mainstream organisations on their own have not been able to penetrate our communities. Um, you know, some of our tribes set up uh, roadblocks, caused a kind of big kerfuffle, how dare you, you know, set up a roadblock on a main road. Uh, and all the community said is, this is how we will keep ourselves safe. And they didn't lock just, you know, random people. They also told their own people who were living in the city, don't come home, stay where you are, stay in place. Um, if you come home, you could bring COVID. You know, so there's lots of those sorts of knowledge of your own community that I still see as Māori knowledge. Thank you. Um, so I was hoping to squeeze in another question, but I've been reminded we are running um, low on time, unfortunately. Um, so uh, I'm, I just have to apologise for everybody who has questions I've not been able to, to get to. There's some really fantastic ones. So thank you all so much for your fantastic engagement. That, that's brilliant. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you so much again, Linda, for a wonderful, refreshing and, and really fascinating, insightful talk. Um, it's been wonderful being able to host you, um, hear again about your work, but also I think for me it was really valuable hearing the engagement with the questions as well. I, I'm sure everybody got a lot out of that. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity again to just thank the IGCD um, and also to mention there's a few new talks coming up um, over the next few weeks, which some of you may be interested in. Um, Next Wednesday, um, between two and three, there'll be a talk on race and climate change with Dr. Adrienne Collins, um, which looks fascinating. Adrienne will be discussing her recent paper showing how decentering whiteness can make space for greater recognition of the role played by the environment in process of racialization. And then on the 27th of um, October, again, a Wednesday, two to three, we're gonna have the annual lecture on decentering migration research the challenges of walking the talk. And that's with um, Professor Heaven Crawley. So some really fascinating talks coming up. I hope you can all join us for those. And thanks again to Linda. Thank you for the support from Sarah and um, Tara. And thanks all so much for your, for your questions and engagement. Okay. Hope to see you all soon. <laughs>